Morning everyone, welcome back to The Lookout. Today's September 8th and we're going to talk a little bit about the severity of the Cold War fire. Um, severity is basically where we describe how the fire affected the vegetation. Now, sometimes fires burn everything and then all you have left is a black stick forest. Other times they burn um, on the ground and they kill small trees and brush but they leave the larger trees. So we're going to talk a bit about severity in general and then in particular, we're going to look at what we've got in the Calder fire. Now, the best tools we have for measuring severity are satellite imagery. And so um, there's some great new imagery from uh, the European Space Agency that um, comes from a satellite called Sentinel and uh, goes over every five days. This is free, free stuff. Um, so what we're looking at here is um, what we call false color image where we take the different uh, wavelengths of light from the satellite and we color them to look at something of interest to us. Um, the reason I use the particular bands that I'm looking at here is because I can see through smoke with them. So in general, shades of blue here are living vegetation and the shades of brown are um, pretty much barren. So we're looking over Omo Ranch in towards Grizzly Flats. Oftentimes you can see um, the severity really reflects um, how fast the fire moved through and how intense the fire was. So the big run that took out Grizzly Flats and made the, you know, um, the big spread all in one day. Um, you can really see that in this image as the brown area that's all in the center of the screen. It's just all really burned hot. Uh, coming down towards Omo Ranch, you can see that, um, you know, the fire kind of, after it made its big run, it was kind of backing down the canyon. Um, and usually on the heel of the fire and on the sides or the flanks, we'll see lower fire severity. So we expect to see high severity at the head, and then we'll see lower severity um, in places where it's backing down in. Also, we see different kind of um, severity reflected in the type of vegetation. So oftentimes, you know, oak woodland or other places that are mainly grass, um, they don't burn as hot. And um, you see more kind of blue on the image afterwards. So the blue is just kind of places that still have green foliage of some sort and all the shades in between brown and blue are uh, mixed. So we're coming up here over um, you know, Sly Park and oftentimes our firing operations too, if we do them at under the right conditions and they behave more like a prescribed fire, they don't kill all the trees. So here along E16 where a lot of the firing got done in people's backyards, you can see that a lot of trees survived. We're coming up here now, we're, um, we're pretty much going to fly up the Highway 50 corridor. And um, we talked during the fire about how the, as the fire was backing into Highway 50, you're going to have a lot of good lower intensity fire. So here, I think this is Plum Creek we're looking at, um, southwest of Light Hall. You know, still a lot of green trees in there. It's going to pop up here a little and look back down. Um, this is this area we talked about um, in the big initial run of the fire. All that brown. You know, so that's so just a the problem with a big chunk of um, killed forest like this. I mean, there's lots of problems, but the biggest is that now all the trees there are going to be the same age for hundreds of years. And that just increases the fire hazard. You know, when we've got a whole bunch of baby trees that are all packed in that are 10 years old or 20 years old or 30 years old. It's a lot of work to thin that all and maintain it in a fire safe condition. And so we end out with this big, what we call a single age class. Um, and densely packed in trees can burn more like brush than trees. So when we talk about reforestation after fire, it's important that we don't plant too many trees because we can't assume that, you know, um, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, the forest service will have the money or resources, to thin this area. And what we've seen kind of time and time again in uh, California is that after a fire, the Forest Service um, wants to salvage log and then plant a whole bunch of new trees. And that's fine if you have a long-term plan for managing the land for timber, but if you don't have the resources and the Forest Service doesn't have the resources and money right now to manage the land that they have, um, you just end up with a thicket that's not that's highly likely to burn before we ever grow a tree that's big enough to make a two by four out of or grow to keep as a large tree on the landscape. 
So as we're moving into this post fire mode now on all these big fires, we really need to look at what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked and what hasn't worked in the past is coming in and planting a whole bunch of new trees and then just walking away and, um, without acknowledging the limitations in our ability to manage these landscapes. So, you know, after big fires in the Stanislaus National Forest in 1987, um, we did a ton of salvage and we planted millions and millions of trees. And then the Rim Fire took a lot of those out in uh, 2014 just because we hadn't ever really had the resources to thin and manage those plantations. So looking out over Kybers, um, a little higher elevation here, the fire moved through here in kind of some spurts. Um, it ran hard to the east um, a few days after the big run by Grizzly Flats. And then it flanked a lot off to the side. So you can see here we've got more of what we call a mosaic burn pattern. There's a lot of patches here that still have forest. So it's not all just, you know, one big black moonscape. A lot of that has to do with the time that the fire burned. You know, if the fire burned at night or if it burned, um, you know, in the morning. Oftentimes it's burning with lower severity. And then these big patches of brown are places that often that the fire is making a run in the afternoon. So when you think of a continuum of weather running from midnight to the next midnight, you know, overnight the temperature dr um, drops, the humidity goes up, and by you know, three or four in the morning it's you know there's dew and it's cool out. And then through the day that is kind of drying out and by you know noon or one we had smoke on these fires and then the smoke would start to lift out. And so you'd have this kind of period we call the kind of peak burning period that runs from like maybe two in the afternoon till um, the sun goes down. So that's when you're likely to get these brown patches is um, during that peak burning period. But the rest of the day and evening and morning, um, you can get lower severity fire effects. So that's all reflected in the mosaic that we end up seeing on the ground is just when things burned, what the wind was doing, what the smoke was doing. All those things affect the mosaic that we have of a fire after it burns. So let's see, let's see if we can drive this thing here and come over here and just um, look down on Wright's Lake and this area that burned um, up out of 50. Um, a lot of these runs that we had here were um, kind of fairly abrupt slope driven runs where the um, wind and slope align and that's why this area here to the south of Wright's Lake burned so hot. You can see over a little farther here um, oh, my Google Earth is locked up. I'm going to have to just pause for a second. Okay, back at it. Um, we're looking up the canyon towards Strawberry um, up Highway 50. And this is an area that the fire um, was kind of spreading up the canyon higher on the hills and backing down in. And this is one of the reasons that they were able to save so many cabins along Highway 50 in this area. It was just that the fire was um, fire doesn't like to run downhill in canyons. Um, for the most part, it likes to run up the hill and out. So um, oftentimes we see lower severity in the bottom of deep canyons just because... Um, of, of that the fire often is backing in um, coming up towards strawberry and looking up um, station creek where we originally thought we might hold it on these dozer lines okay so we're looking south here over highway 50 um, on these north slopes there were um, some some big old growth stands in these areas and it looks like you know, at least right now from this imagery, it looks like a lot of the bigger trees in here survived, especially down kind of deep in these canyons where the, the fire was backing down in. Um, we talked at that time when the fire was getting ready to blow out of here about alignment and this idea that um, fires like to run downwind and um, uphill in areas that have heavy fuels. And so in those areas where you naturally have alignment, oftentimes you've had a what we call a fire regime of high severity fire. So, you know, often on the upper slopes of an area that faces down Canyon, um, in the past we've had fires that would run up the Canyon and get alignment like this fire did. So we don't expect to see old growth forest on the top of a big South facing slope coming out of a Canyon often, 
because historically over thousands of years, these are the areas that have had hot fire over and over and over again. So it's more likely, you know, at the top of a big slope coming out of a canyon that you'll have brush or you'll have small trees. But um, this is important when we talk about conservation. Um, you know, if if we're if people are interested in preserving old growth, um, you probably don't want to go stand in front of a bulldozer or a logging operation at the top of a south facing slope. Um, you know, during the uh, 1990s in the Klamath Mountains, the Forest Service designated areas to be kind of um, future old growth, but a lot of those were on south facing upper slopes. And so, um, you know, if you want to think of a place that you're going to grow big old trees um, for the lot for the future. It's probably going to be in the kind of bottom of a shady north-facing slope. So that's just an aside. But um, here at Strawberry, this is where the fire made that big run up and out, um, up through Sierra Tahoe to Echo Summit. Um, so as you'd expect, this area, it burned pretty hot. You know, fire was moving here, uh, really moved out. And so um, this corridor here around uh, Twin Bridges up through um, Echo Summit burned pretty hot. Got a cat meowing here. Sorry. Um, so this imagery was taken yesterday, or um, actually taken on the sixth of November. And you can see that the fire was still burning here in this area up towards Cody Lake, uh, up towards Kirkwood. The yellow is the perimeter today, um, the night of the seventh of September. We're looking back down towards Strawberry and into those areas in the bottom of the canyon where we talked about having um, still some big old growth trees. Okay, so we're kind of panning over Sierra Tahoe now and up into the um, Christmas Valley. And we're going to take a look here at um, Myers and the fire here that... Um, burned up on a trimmer peak after it crossed at Christmas Valley and it burned pretty hot. You know, you can see, um, where it made its run up the trimmer peak and, um, there's a little strip right in the middle that looks like it didn't burn quite as hot, but in general it burned really hot. And then here where the fire's backing into Echo Lake, it's been burning hot for days here on this North slope and you can kind of see the intensity there. Um, Expected a lot of that's going to be really pretty, uh, pretty cooked. Out here on our right is just all the granite of the high country. Anyway, that's your introduction to uh, fire severity and a look at the overall severity of the Calder fire in general after it made its big run early in the fire. We had a lot of mixed severity going through the El Dorado National Forest. Also a lot of private timberland in there. And um, so, I mean, the good news is that there's a lot of going to be a lot of green trees in the canyons and uh, the bad news is just that we do have some pretty large pockets here high severity fire and um, we really need to have that conversation now about um, realistic goals for post-fire restoration you know and not just go and do what we've been doing forever which is to throw a ton of trees in the ground and then walk away and hope for the best you know we got to talk about um acknowledge that the Forest Service has really limited capacity to do anything right now except fight fires. And, uh, you know, if we want to be managing our forests for fire resilience, it's going to require spending these billions of dollars that we're spending on suppression up front on forestry. And it's also going to require an enormous change in our workforce and uh, a move in our culture towards land stewardship, you know, prioritizing it, making jobs, creating economies around restoration right now we've created a, a huge economy around fire suppression um, and we spend billions of dollars on fires like this in a Dixie and after it's done all we have to show for it's a burned forest and a bunch of dozer line um, so if we could turn around and put even a fraction of what we're spending on suppression into stewardship uh, it'd go a long way towards resilience of our forests thanks for watching the lookout if you appreciate the work we're doing, please consider um, making a donation. Now that we're moving out of fire season, um, we've got an option on our PayPal for subscriptions. And those something like that, a subscription, you know, even $5 a month, um, is going to help us stay motivated to do this work through the winter when we don't have 
um, the gratitude of thousands of people who found out their home didn't burn. Um, anyway, we're in it for the long haul. So if you can help us out, we appreciate it. And we'll keep teaching what we know.